All right, I remember to turn the microphone on today. No bumper today, so I had to get up here quickly. Uh, but I just want to say good morning, Grace Church. Good morning to everyone. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and grandmothers in the room. And if you hadn't uh, realized, we're having some technical difficulties with our projector, so some of the slides may not show up back there, but that's okay. I'll read them for you. You may just have to take some more notes, that's all. Um, you know, I want to say happy Mother's Day to my beautiful wife, Gwen, all the way in the back. Because I say happy Mother's Day to her because I tell her that I will always be her biggest child. <laughs> you know, and if it, if it weren't for mothers, we wouldn't, none of us would be here today. Uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away in 2012. Uh, but she, though, is the one that gave me a foundation for the church in my younger years. She taught Sunday school when I was little. And when I was younger, my drug problem was I was drugged to church, which was a good thing. You know, and, and I can't help but think that she's looking down right now on me proudly. You know, I'm so honored to be able to be here and bring you the message this morning. Would you bow your heads and join me in a short prayer? Heavenly Father, let me step out of myself. Speak through me today so the words that go out of my mouth do not return to me empty. Amen. Now, most of you know I am originally from the suburbs of Chicago, so there's a little lingering of a Chicago accent. And yes, I'm a Cubs fan and a Bears fan. Uh, now, there was a columnist in Chicago that wrote for many of the newspapers throughout the years. His name was Mike Royko. He actually won a Pulitzer Prize for his column in 1972. He reported this true story many years ago in the Chicago Tribune. A man named Bill Mallory traveled to India to discover the purpose of life, but he didn't find it there. So after returning, he noticed a sign at a Chevron gas station that simply said, as you travel, ask us. So every time he pulled into a Chevron gas station, he looked at a sign and say, I'm a traveler. Let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of life? These are the true answers that he got. I am not making this up. First guy said, I'm sorry, I'm new here. <laughs> Se second guy said, I don't remember anything in the manual about that. One guy uh, said, I I'm not much for the church myself, sir. Now, one guy actually kind of gave him a leering look and a wink, whatever that meant. Most, though, would just kind of give him a blank stare and continue to wash his windshield. But he kept asking at all the Chevron stations. One day, Mr. Mallory got a phone call from Chevron Customer Relations. The guy on the phone said, uh, we understand you've been asking our dealer questions and getting unsatisfactory answers. The man suggested that he write out his question and send it to Chevron Corporate with a self-addressed stamped envelope. So Bill Mallory wrote, what is the purpose of life, and sent it to Chevron Gas Company. A Couple weeks later, he gets his envelope returned. The only thing in it was an application for a credit card. <laughs> now, th this, though, this does give us a touch of irony, suggesting that in our consumer-driven society, even the pursuit of life's ultimate questions can be reduced to a commercial transaction. But this does beg for us to ask the same question that Mr. Mallory asked. What is the purpose of life? Now, you may have guessed by our theme for today, the heart of worship, what my answer to that question is. Our purpose in life is to worship God. Now, this isn't solely my answer, but let me back it up with some scripture. Isaiah 43, 21 says, The people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. We were formed to praise and worship God. God loves us so much, the Bible teaches. But God wants us to love him back. And as we saw last week, as we ended our series, Flawed Faith, where we've been walking through the life of Peter, we saw that the last stage in the life of faith is stage six, transformed by love. Pastor Larry reminded us that Jesus gives us a second chance at the first calling. So I want to tell you, worship is knowing and loving God back. It's our primary objective. It's our highest priority. It's our number one purpose in life. If we have been transformed by love, we want to love God back for all that he's done in our lives. So what does worship look like? Well, I'm sure many of us think that worship is just the singing and the music part. Well, that is part of worship. Thankfully for me, it's only one part because I can't sing. It's gotta be really loud because nobody wants to hear my singing. 
Uh, but it, it is singing, but it's, worship is also so much more. It's communion. It's giving to the church, whether with our time and talents or our tithes and offerings. It's also giving back to our community as well. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What this is, this is turning my will and my life over to the care of God. Worship is the way I react. It's the way I respond to God when he loves me. When that verse says God's mercy, that's, we, that's, this is how we react. But God, though, he takes the initiative. I'll tell you, you know, worship is my response to God's love. God always makes the first move. Now, I was told he is a gentleman. He won't come in until he's invited, but he always makes the first move. He creates us. He saves us. He forgives us. He blesses us. He protects us. As a result, we respond in worship. That word in the uh, Romans verse that says offer, where we offer our bodies, that word describes worship. Worship is giving back to God that which was so freely given to us. Whenever you give back to God, whenever you offer anything to God, that's called worship. Whether it's singing or anything else, our worship brings pleasure to God. Now, you might be saying, though, God's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He has everything. Just what do I have to offer? You give him your love. Both Matthew and Mark wrote of what Jesus said was the greatest commandment. And here's how it was recorded in Mark 12, verse 30. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's a lot of alls. But what this does, th this uh, tells us three ways that God wants us to love him. God wants us to love him thoughtfully. God wants us to love him thoughtfully with our minds. Think it through. So not just do it without thinking. Think, think, think. Think about God's love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace. Think on how he's transformed us and brought us through difficult times in our lives. You know, as my dad used to tell me when I was younger, use your head for something besides a hat rack. <laughs> Be consciously thoughtful in loving God. And the second way God wants us to love him is passionately. Passionately. This one is an emotional response. The verse in Mark said, with all your heart and with all your soul. This is at the deepest level of ourself. It's a passionate and emotional response. God passionately loves us, and he wants us to passionately love him back. And the third way is practically. God wants us to love him thoughtfully, passionately, and practically. This is where it says, with all your strength, with all, all your abilities. God wants your attention. God wants your affection. God wants your ability. God wants our attention, affection, and ability. And one of the greatest expressions of our love is displayed by our attention. Think of it this way. Remember the first time you fell in love? Or maybe the most recent time. You just couldn't get that person off your mind. God is like that. His love is always focused on us. And, and whether you know it or not, God's love is focused on you right now. The, this Psalm of David tells us this in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 3. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. All. God is always focused on us. He's familiar with all our ways. We, though, we kind of get distracted, don't we? Oh, squirrel, something shiny over here, right? We get distracted. Kind of like CJ, right? We have to choose to focus on things, choose to focus on God. Because let's be honest, uh, we are self-centered by nature. Now, I love the Apostle Paul's writings because I believe he really understood our human nature. I mean, he got me. And I love what he said in Romans 8, 7, and I really like the message paraphrase on this one. It says, focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, 
and ends up thinking more about self than God. Ooh, I know this one from personal experience very well. Not good. Because when I'm completely absorbed in self, I am definitely ignoring God. And that's not what God wants. He wants me to focus on him. I have to choose to do that consciously. Now, and we're also self-centered by culture. The world around us teaches us this. Our culture today is so individualistic. I mean, go into any bookstore and look and see how large the self-help section is. You know, our culture teaches us we're taught to be strong. Take pride in yourself. Stand up for yourself. Be yourself, and on and on. But Paul said, Romans 12 too, he said, and do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is Paul here telling us as Christians we're called higher, to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. We're called to do it different, to do it the way God wants us to do it. If we focus our attention on God, he will transform us and renew our minds, meaning we'll think and act differently. So maybe you're asking this question right now. Just how do we focus our attention on God? How do we do this thing? Well, let me get a little practical here and give us four ways to do just that. Now, there's many other ways, but today I want to stick with four ways that we can help us focus our attention on God. And the first one is establish a quiet time. Set apart a set daily time with God. I do this every morning as I drink my coffee. Uh, I put on some soaking music, which is some Christian music with no words to distract me. And I have a couple of daily devotionals I read, and I follow a Bible reading plan. And then I spend some time in prayer and meditation with God. Now, in fact, don't take my word for it, but let's see what Jesus said about this matter. In Matthew 6, 6, Jesus said, But when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray with your to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I like rewards. Anybody else? Well, this is Jesus here telling us to set some time apart, a quiet time with God. And the second way we can focus our attention on God is develop a constant conversation with God. Develop a constant conversation with God. Now, when you have a conversation, you know, part of that is talking and part of that is listening. When I'm talking to God, that's prayer. Listening to God is meditation. And not just in our established quiet time, but do this constantly. You want to know of another really good time to do this? It's when you're driving in the car alone. Have that conversation with God. Here's a couple of verses that help me um, remember to do this. Psalm 105.4 says, Look to the Lord and his strength. Oh, I need his strength. That's for sure. I can't do this on my own. Seek his face always. If I remember this, I'm going to remember to have a conversation with God. And Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. I especially, I love this last verse from Isaiah, uh, telling us that God will keep us in perfect peace. Ooh, I like that. I could use that perfect peace. Anybody else want some of that? Well, if we focus our attention on God, which is that part of the verse that says, meaning our minds are steadfast and we trust in God, this is what he gives us, perfect peace. So, and another way to help us focus our attention on God is to practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. Be thankful for all that God has done in our lives. Now, many of you have heard me say before that making a gratitude list is a really good thing to get in the habit of doing. And it helps in so many ways. Consciously make an effort to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Because then you're going to find yourself asking, uh, am I grateful enough? I think not. And the fourth way that can help us focus our attention on God is practice surrender. Practice surrender. You know, if I can keep in the forefront of my mind that my self-centered, selfish ways, my wanting to control everything, uh, my wife Gwen and I, uh, joke frequently about having control issues, but if I remember, if I can keep that to the forefront of my mind, how my ways have never worked out well, and that I need to practice surrendering to, to God daily. And it goes back to that Romans 12, 1 verse of the sacrifice of self helps me to focus on God. We need to practice surrendering to him daily. Worship is also ex expressing my affection to God. Tell God you love him. 
He said it first. He's taking the risk away. In fact, 1 John 4, 19 says we love because he first loved us. It's like, re remember back when you were just getting to know someone and dating them? It was risky to be the first one to say I love you. I remember when I was dating my wife Gwen, I didn't want to say I love you first because if she didn't say it back, that would be really awkward. Little confession. I, I may have manipulated her into saying it first. <laughs> I told her, I said, you have something of mine. She says, what's that? I said, you have my heart. And that prompted Gwen to say she loved me for the very first time. And yes, I said it back. And I love you, honey, to this day. But God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me, Hosea 6, 6. Now, this is God telling you, he wants us to know him and to love him. He doesn't want ritual, religion, rules, and regulations. You know, in fact, the word religion comes from the Latin word legere, which means to bind, and re, meaning again. So literally it means return to bondage. No, God wants to have a relationship with us. The greatest way we can worship God is to give our life to him by surrendering to his will. That's the essence of love. Remember, it's always a response to God. God gave us life. He loved us first. He says, I want to give yourself completely back to me. Now, what holds us back? Well, for most of us, it's fear. Scared to death. Afraid God is going to turn, in you, turn you into some religious nutcase. <laughs> I'll become a fanatic. Now, God doesn't desire to turn you into a goofball. I'm already one. Uh, he, he made you to be you. God loves you the way you are. And I can tell you that I was afraid too. I remember many years ago, I'm at a meeting, and this guy goes, I'm a Jesus freak. I'm like, ooh. One of those, steer clear. I mean, I'm a believer in everything, but I was not ready to scream that and yell it from the rafters. Well, today, I, can tell you, I love the old song DC, by DC Talks, Jesus Freak, because I am a Jesus Freak, and I'm proud to say that today. Yeah. We got some other ones in the house. Awesome. So let me tell you this short story. Um, Liz Curtis Higgs was one of the best-known disc jockeys in America, and she lived quite a wild life. She had a really wild lifestyle without God. In fact, uh, one time she was working at a radio station in Detroit, and the AM uh, person was Howard Stern. And Liz Curtis Higgs had the PM show. And one day, Howard Stern said to Liz, you know, you really need to clean up your act. Now, if Howard Stern is telling you this, it's really saying something. I mean, she was a little on the wild side. And because Liz Curtis Higgs had been burned by so many men, and her heart had been broken, and she had been hurt by so many men, uh, she became a militant feminist. And I underscore militant feminist. But at this radio station, she also had a Christian girlfriend who kept inviting her to church over and over. And so after a long time, she finally said, okay, I'll go to church one time and one time only. So she went to church one time with her friend. And that week, uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, the pastor just happened to be teaching on the Bible verse that says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Okay, probably not the best verse to start out with for a militant feminist. I mean, she, she got a little uptight, a little ticked, a little angry, uh, but she continued to listen. She actually heard the second part of the verse, which nobody ever talks about. I'm going to tell you what the second part of the verse was. Uh, she continued like saying, she actually heard that. You see, the second part of the verse says, and husbands, you sacrifice yourself. You give yourself for your wives, just as Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for the church and died for her. I mean, people don't ever hear that, hear that second part of that verse, do they? I mean, who is supposed to die in this, the husband or the wife? So when Liz heard that part, she leaned over to her friend and said with a little cynicism, well, shoot, I'd gladly give myself to any man if I knew he would die for me. And her friend leaned over, and he said, Liz, there is a man who loved you enough to die for you. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, not long after that mic drop moment, Liz dropped her guard. 
She surrendered her life to God in love and became a believer. Today, she's a well-known Christian author and speaker. So I know some of you may be thinking, I don't love God enough. I want to tell you that isn't your problem. The real problem is you don't realize how much God loves you. If you really knew how much God loved you and cares about every detail in your life, we'd all be throwing ourselves at him. Worship is always a response. Another thing worship is, worship is using my abilities for God. Now, say that with me. Oh, it's not up there. Worship is using my abilities for God. That's a practical expression of worship and love. So let me share this verse with you from Colossians, because if, if you get this verse, it can change your life. You ready? It's in Colossians 3.23, and it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, all, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So, so this verse can help us understand that in order to worship God, you don't have to change jobs. You change who you're working for. You're working for the Lord. When you change who you're working for, it becomes worship. God is saying he wants you to invite him to every aspect of your life. When you give it all to God and keep focused on him, all, all of our work becomes a form of worship. This is practicing this in all of our affairs. All. In life, it's not what you do that matters. It's who you do it for. It's not what you do that matters. It's who you do it for. Now, it doesn't matter if it's cleaning toilets, cooking dinner for others, or being the CEO of a large company. You can do it for God. And when we do this as if we're working for God, then our work turns into worship. This way of living, it doesn't happen just the one hour we're in here at church on Sunday mornings. It's but what we do the other 167 hours of the week out there, out in the real world. It happens in the ordinary, everyday life. It happens at work, at the store, sleeping, eating, all around us. Real worship is not just coming in here and singing. It's a lifestyle. And I challenge all of us to live a lifestyle of worship to God. We're going to worship something. I mean, maybe you're worshiping your career. Maybe you're focusing on things of this world, pleasure, another person, or any number of things. The absolute worst thing we can do and one of life's greatest temptations is to worship something other than God. Oh, I've been there. Not a good place to be, because uh, whenever you love something more than God, here's what you're going to get. Chaos, conflict, stress, and problems in your life. In a word, unmanageability. So I want to tell you this truth about worship. Worship is loving God wholeheartedly. Say that with me. Worship is loving God wholeheartedly. This is an all, not with some of our heart, but with all of our heart. Because when I seek God wholeheartedly, I can have hope for the future. Can have hope for the future. Now, I invite you to do the same thing. No matter what doubts you have, what struggles you may be going through, in the midst of it all, God is focused on you and he loves you. I challenge you, no matter how difficult the road seems, no matter how dark it is, choose to worship anyways. Seek God wholeheartedly. Now, as we wrap up our time together today, let us reflect on the heart of worship, responding to God's love. We've journeyed through the importance of a worship as our primary purpose in life, our highest priority, and our true and proper response to God's love. Just as Bill Mallory sought the purpose of life in worldly places, well, we often find ourselves searching for meaning in fleeting pursuits. Yet the truth remains, our ultimate purpose is found in worshiping God. Isaiah 43, 21 reminds us that we were created to proclaim his praise, to respond to his love with adoration and gratitude. Worship isn't confined to a single act or moment. It encompasses every aspect of our lives, from our thoughts and emotions, to our actions and abilities. It's about loving God thoughtfully, passionately, and practically, giving him our attention, affection, and ability. We've explored practical ways to focus our attention on God, 
from establishing quiet times of intimacy to maintaining a constant conversation with him throughout the day. We've seen that worship is more than just singing. It's a lifestyle that permeates every facet of our existence. But what holds us back from wholehearted worship? Often it's fear. The fear of surrendering completely to God, of being transformed into someone we don't recognize. Yet, as we saw in Liz Curtis Higgs' story, true freedom is found in surrendering to the one who loved us first, the one who sacrificed himself for us. So at this time, I'd like to invite the band to start making their way back up here. And I want us to let us embrace the truth that worship is always a response. It's a response to God's unfailing love, his relentless pursuit of our hearts. It's about using our abilities, no matter how seemingly insignificant, to glorify him in all that we do. As we go out of here today, may we carry the essence of worship with us into every moment of our lives. May our hearts overflow with love for the one who first loved us. And may our lives be a continual offering of praise and adoration to our God. May we never forget that worship is not just an act, but it's a way of life. A life lived in loving devotion to our creator and sustainer. And may his love compel us to worship him wholeheartedly. So we're going to sing another song, and we're going to have some time where you can come up here to the altar and worship him. Give him your heart and have that conversation with God. Now, if you're joining us online, make where you're at a place of prayer as well. You know, we have prayer partners up here uh, who will be more than happy to pray with you. If you want someone to pray with you, just raise your hand. Will you bow your heads and join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us first. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. We worship and praise you, Lord. Give you all of our heart in all that we do. You, Lord, were the one who gives us strength and sustains us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open.